Let's head on back to Raspberry Pi, and I'm very excited to explore the possibilities of GameCube emulation on the Pi 5 with Android 14. This is going to be a pretty hefty video, and we will cover the install process of Android 14, the Dolphin setup, and then a massive 50 game showcase with settings as needed. It's been a lot of fun exploring the GameCube library on the Pi 5, and I think the results are pretty solid. So please join me, Rob the Retro Tech Dad, as we dive into GameCube emulation with Dolphin on the Raspberry Pi 5. Since this video is featuring GameCube emulation using the Dolphin emulator for Android, I thought it would be a good idea to walk through the install process of Android 14 and getting it all ready for your Raspberry Pi 5 up to the point of getting the Play Store and of course Dolphin emulator all set up and ready to go. If you already have Android 14 running on your Raspberry Pi 5, feel free to make use of the Dolphin setup timestamp in the video to skip ahead. For this of course, you will need a micro SD card. I do recommend going with a larger size as you can make use of the available storage in Android to keep your games locally on the micro SD. Personally, I'll be using this 1TB micro SD card I had purchased recently on sale. In addition, you will need a USB drive to transfer some files over. It doesn't really need to be anything large since the files are relatively small in size. I also recommend having a keyboard and mouse nearby as it will help make the setup process a bit easier. So first things first, let's get our micro SD and USB drive prepped. We will go ahead and download all the files we need for this, which is as follows. Consta King's Android 14 build for Raspberry Pi 5. The Android 14 resize zip to make full use of the storage available on the micro SD. Mine the gaps for Play Store access. The device ID APK to obtain the Google services ID from the Pi 5. And lastly, the Raspberry Pi imager tool. Let's start first by heading on over to Consta King's website to grab the Android 14 build that was created for the Raspberry Pi 5. I will have a link to the website down in my description. To keep things simple, I have directly linked the Google Drive from Consta King's website. I definitely recommend making a dedicated folder for all of these downloads to keep things nice and organized. While we are here, we can proceed to grab the Android 14 resize zip from Consta King's website as well. Once again, I will have a direct link for this down in the description. Now it's time to head on over to the Mind the Gaps GitHub page, which is needed to add Google Play Store access to your Raspberry Pi 5. I have directly linked the specific file of Mind the Gaps, which is going to be the Android 14 ARM64 build. The latest release is from October 25th, 2023, which is the one I have used and tested with. Download the zip file and make sure to save it to the folder where you're collecting all the necessary files. Okay, now let's go ahead and grab the device ID APK. I am using the one from AA Tech, and I will have a direct link to this APK file, which will allow you to get the Google services ID needed to register the Pi 5 for Play Store access. Let's now head on over to the Raspberry Pi website and grab the Raspberry Pi imager tool. Again, I will have this linked in the description. Download the imager tool depending on the operating system you're using. For this video, I am using Windows 10, and so keep this in mind if you are following along on another operating system. After getting all the files, we are now ready to flash Android 14 to our micro SD card. Go ahead and grab the card you're using and connect it to your computer. I like this multi-format USB adapter that has been very reliable for me all these years. Head on over to the location that you store your files and install the imager.exe which is for the Raspberry Pi imager. This should be a very quick install and when it's finished go ahead and open it up so we can flash Android 14 to the micro SD card. You should now have the Raspberry Pi imager main screen and the first thing we will do is select the Raspberry Pi device, which of course is the Pi 5. Now we need to select the operating system and we will scroll all the way down and select the use custom option. Go to the folder where you saved all the downloaded files and select the Consta King Android 14 zip file. You do not need to extract the contents and it will work in zip format. Finally, select the storage device you are flashing to. Make sure to carefully select the right device. In this case, I am flashing to my one terabyte micro SD card. Hit next and now we are presented with the OS customization screen. Just click on no since we will not be applying any OS customization settings. You will get one more screen with a warning asking if you want to continue. Click on yes to proceed. The imager tool will now do its thing which will take a few minutes so grab a cup of joe or your favorite beverage in the meantime. Once it has finished you will definitely know since on Windows you will get a whole bunch of screens popping up. Just click on cancel for all the windows until you get back to the imager tool screen and click continue. You can now remove the micro SD card and place it into your Raspberry Pi 5. But before you head on over to your Pi 5, 
Let's get the USB drive all ready to go. You will want to copy over the Mind the Gaps zip file, the device ID APK, and the Android 14 resize zip to the USB drive. Once you have copied all of these files over, you can eject the USB drive and keep it to the side for now until we have installed Android on the Pi 5. Okay, now back to your Pi 5. You should have the micro SD card ready to go in there. Turn on your Pi 5 and let the magic happen. If all goes well, you should see the Android logo pop up on screen after a moment, and then you will land on the main screen, which will look like this and is very vanilla with not much installed. So now we can make use of the USB drive. I'd recommend plugging into the faster USB port, and you will also want to make sure that you have your USB keyboard and mouse ready to go here since it will make things much easier. Regardless, a mouse is required for the next steps. You will either need to drag down from the top with your mouse to access settings or drag up from the bottom with your mouse to access settings. Once in settings, scroll down until you see the system option. Click on system and then scroll all the way to the bottom to get to the Raspberry Pi settings. Select the first option, which is the reboot to recovery and it will toggle on that option. Now you can drag down from the top again and select restart, which will get us into recovery mode. You should now be on the Team Win Recovery Project main screen. Click on Install, then click on Select Storage. Choose your USB drive, and the files we added should appear in this list. Let's start with the AOSP14 Resize Zip, which will allow us to recover the unallocated storage on the microSD card. Click on the zip file, and then swipe with your mouse to confirm the flash operation. Give it a moment, and the operation should complete. Select Wipe Dalvik, then swipe with your mouse to wipe. Now, reboot the system. So let's check in settings that we do in fact have all of the storage available to us. In settings, scroll down, select storage, and then you can see that I do have all one terabyte available to access. Okay, we still need to go back into recovery. So the same as before, scroll down to system, then scroll all the way down to Raspberry Pi settings, and then finally enable the reboot into recovery option. Now reboot your Raspberry Pi so we can install the Google Play Store components. Back in TWRP, let's click on install and then select the storage, which is the USB drive, and then the mine the gaps zip should appear. Click on the zip file to install. Like before, swipe with your mouse to confirm the flash. Give it a moment and once finished, just click on reboot and then system to get back into Android. Now in Android, you will notice that we now have the Play Store available as an installed app. Go ahead and open it up and you should get to the sign-in screen. Now go ahead and click on sign-in. After a little bit, you will get a screen that does say the device isn't Play Protect certified, which is where the device ID APK will come into play. If you click on the learn more link on this Google Play Protect screen, you will be taken to the Google website with some information. However, we will come back to this in a moment. Let's get the device ID APK installed so this way you are prepared for the registration process. Open up the Files app and then navigate to your USB drive with the device ID APK. Double click on the APK to install. You might get a warning about enabling installing unknown apps. Click on Settings and then toggle it on to continue installing. Go ahead and install the APK and then when finished, open it up. Scroll all the way down until you find the Google Services Framework ID. Click on Copy and should now be available in your clipboard. Head on back into the Play Store, click Sign In, and then click on the Learn More link to get to the Google website. If you scroll all the way down, you can click on the Device Isn't Certified dropdown. Looking through here, there is a line that says if your device uses a custom ROM, register your device, and that is exactly the link we need to get things going here. Here is where you will sign into your Google account. You should now be on the Device Registration page. Paste the Google Services Framework ID into the empty window. Verify you're not a robot, and then click Register. You should get a prompt that says Device Registered. Now you can try to sign into the Play Store again, but this process does take a little bit to update, so you might want to get a snack and try again a bit later. Sometimes rebooting the Pi 5 will help as well. After some time, you will be finally able to download from the Play Store, and that's exactly what we will do. So let's go ahead and search for Dolphin, and for this video, we will be using the Dolphin build from the Play Store. I have found in my vast amount of testing that overall this is the way to go if you're wanting to do GameCube emulation on the Pi 5. I did try the various forks, and again, I do think this is the best one for this device specifically. Once Dolphin has been installed, let's go ahead and open it up. You should see the main screen for Dolphin. First thing you'll probably want to do is add your games by clicking on the Add Games option in the bottom right. 
navigate to the directory where you keep your GameCube games, and then select Use this folder, and then click Allow. So let's go over some of the general settings being used here. First off, I am using PAL versions of the GameCube games, which tend to be easier to run. This is not always the case, but for this video, every game has been tested with the PAL version. Under Settings, then Config, and then General, you will want to make sure that the Dual Core option is enabled. You can also enable the Cheats option while here, but we will talk about this more when discussing Super Mario Sunshine. Another important option here is the Enable Save States, which for me personally is a must. Scroll all the way down and click on it to enable that option. Go back to Settings and then click on Graphics Settings. For this video, we will be using the OpenGL backend. Vulkan curling does not work here on the Pi 5 with Dolphin and it will just cause the emulator to crash. So under Enhancements, we can adjust the internal resolution. For this showcase, every game is running at the native 1x resolution. Some lighter games might be able to get away with a 2x resolution, but for simplicity, we will leave this at 1x. Now if you scroll all the way down, we have the widescreen hack option. This is a personal choice. I like to enable it because for the most part, it does work pretty well and I like being able to make full use of the widescreen available. You can choose to leave it off and games will just display in the 4x3 aspect ratio. Every other setting should be left as default. There might be some cases where we need to adjust from the default config, but I will let you know during the showcase if that's the case. So go back one step and head into the hacks option. This is going to be a very important section for Dolphin. For now, leave everything as default. I will let you know per game which settings need to be turned on and off. However, for most games here, I'll be letting you know in particular about the immediately present XFB setting. If you go back one step and then into stats, you can enable the frame counter if you'd like by selecting the show FPS option. Now go back to the settings screen and select GameCube input. This is where you can map your controller. For example, I have GameCube controller one enabled and if you click on the gear icon, you can then go in and map each button as needed. I've been using my DualSense controller from the PS5, but I've tested it with various controllers like the Xbox Series and 8-Bit Doe line of controllers. This part is pretty straightforward. Click on the button, then press the button on your controller to map. Let's now back out of Dolphin for a second and talk about one last important thing. This build of Android supports the ability to set higher clocks right from within settings. Now every Pi 5 will be different, and it's really the luck of the draw as to how well your Pi 5 can overclock. You will definitely want something like the official Pi 5 power supply or something that is similar in rating with the 5 volt, 5 amp, 27 watt support. And ideally, you're going to want some active cooling for this. For my Pi 5, it seems to handle 2.7 gigahertz without much issue and so that is what I'll be using here and for the game testing. In settings, scroll down to system and then scroll all the way down to Raspberry Pi settings. Here you will scroll down until you see the overclock section. This is where you can change the maximum CPU frequency. I'll go ahead and set mine to 2.7 GHz since that is what my Pi 5 can handle. However, I recommend going up by 100 MHz at a time until you find something that is stable. So for example, go to 2.5, then 2.6, and so on. One other thing to change here is the CPU governor, which I recommend changing to performance. After that, drag down from the top and go ahead and reboot your Pi 5 to apply the changes. Okay, we are all done here, and now we are ready to get this massive 50 game emulation showcase going, and for this, we will keep it nice and simple and go in alphabetical order. I will show on screen any specific settings that need to be changed from the default Dolphin setup. In addition, some popular games might not be shown here, and there could be various reasons for it ranging from poor performance or other issues, but don't hesitate to ask about a specific game in the comments section, and I will try my best to respond. And 007 Agent Under Fire gets the honor of being the first game on the list, and I was pretty excited to get this one working as I find it to be a pretty fun first-person shooter using the James Bond license. This game features an original storyline that is not based on any of the films. Agent Under Fire did see a release on PlayStation and Xbox as well. For this game, make sure that the immediately present XFB option is set to off. Avalanche is surprisingly one of my favorite games on the GameCube, and I was a huge fan of the original on the Nintendo 64 as well. Avalanche has a pretty awesome soundtrack, and really, I think I'm just a fan of NST games in general. I'm definitely pretty bummed that we haven't seen any new entries in the franchise since this GameCube release. Thankfully, this game does emulate quite well, and is working pretty well here with the Raspberry Pi 5. It does have some occasional dips, but overall, I think this one is quite playable.
staple at this point with the original Animal Crossing. Believe it or not, but this is actually not the first time we would see Animal Crossing since it did originally release in Japan on the Nintendo 64. However, for all of us outside of Japan, this would be the first experience with Animal Crossing, and really, who knew back then how massive this franchise would become for Nintendo? I was also reminded why I never picked this game for testing since this has one of the longest intros ever, but I felt this was well worth including on the list given how well it does run here, and not all that surprising given it's an enhanced port of a Nintendo 64 game. Here we have Baton Kaitos, a very interesting RPG that uses a card themed battle system and comes to us from Monolith Soft, best known for their work on the Xenoblade and Xenosaga franchises. This was always a very cool GameCube exclusive and a standout given that there was a limited amount of RPGs on the console. More recently, this game and the sequel were released as a remaster collection for the Nintendo Switch. Here on the GameCube running on the Pi 5, the game does have some frame rate dips, but personally I don't think it's a huge issue given the gameplay style. For this one, make sure to toggle on the dual core setting since it's turned off by default, as well as enable the immediately present XFB option. Batman Vengeance is a childhood favorite, though I'm pretty sure I was about 15 when I played this one for the first time. Batman Vengeance is a surprisingly solid action game based on the TV series The New Batman Adventures. I wasn't too surprised by the performance here, and I expected this one to perform pretty well here on the Raspberry Pi 5. Batman Vengeance was also released for the PS2, Xbox, PC, and even the Game Boy Advance. Bloody Roar Primal Fury is our first fighting game for this showcase and was released on GameCube and then ported to Xbox later on. Bloody Roar was a pretty popular fighting game franchise that hasn't been seen since its last release, Bloody Roar 4 back in 2003. This game is running pretty well here on the Raspberry Pi 5, but I did observe some frame dips here and there, but it's definitely pretty playable. For this one, make sure to turn on the immediately present XFB setting. Here is another licensed game, Buffy the Vampire Slayer Chaos Bleeds is actually the fourth game in the Buffy the Vampire Slayer franchise. Personally, I remember the Xbox exclusive the most, but I did play Chaos Bleeds as well since I was quite the fan of the original Xbox game. This game takes place during the fifth season of the show, and you get to control multiple characters beyond just the usual Buffy. This game runs really well on the Pi 5, and overall is working great. Hey look, someone learned to whittle. Next up we have an entry for one of my absolute favorite racing franchises, Burnout 2 Point of Impact is the second entry in the series and really was an awesome sequel at the time of release. Interestingly, Burnout 2 was the last game in the series to be released on GameCube and also the last with acclaim as the publisher. Once the series made the shift to electronic arts, GameCube would not get the next game in the series with Burnout 3. This game is doing really well here on the Raspberry Pi 5 and for this game I do have the immediately present XFB setting turned off. Cell Damage is a really fun vehicular combat game that was released very early on in the GameCube's life and was also released on Xbox and PS2. Cell Damage has a great art style that is meant to be a cartoonish take on games like Twisted Metal. Cell Damage has been re-released in an HD version for modern consoles including the Nintendo Switch. I'm pretty happy to see Cell Damage running really well here on the Pi 5 and I definitely recommend checking it out if you are a fan of these kind of games. Here is another Nintendo published game making the list, and Chibi Robo here is actually the first game in the franchise and so this series got its start on the GameCube. The studio behind this game, Skip Limited, is no stranger to weird games and is responsible for stuff like Captain Rainbow if you want to get an idea of what they've done. It's hard not to love Chibi Robo given the adorable robot and it's definitely an interesting exclusive game to check out for the GameCube. For Chibi Robo you will want to make sure the immediately present XFB setting is turned off, but otherwise this game runs quite well on the Pi 5. It's time to talk about Crash Bandicoot, and in particular, Crash Nitro Kart. The Crash series was no longer being developed by Naughty Dog for the 6th gen consoles, including the GameCube. Instead, Vicarious Visions took the helm here with Nitro Kart. Now, I showed off some gameplay of Wrath of Cortex running on PS2 with Ether SX2 in my review video of the Pi 5, and so here I thought it would be fun to feature the race of games that came out for the GameCube. The first one being Nitro Kart, which does really well on Dolphin with the Pi 5, and I have to say that the game looks awesome too. 
And for the second Crash Racing game, here we have Crash Tag Team Racing, which came out two years after Nitro Kart and was actually handled by Radical Entertainment instead of Vicarious Visions. This one had some interesting racing mechanics that made it a bit different than Nitro Kart and even the Naughty Dog developed Crash Team Racing. You actually get to control Crash on foot and so it blends both the platformer style with the kart racing. Personally, I like both of the Crash Racing games on GameCube for different reasons and despite it not being developed by Naughty Dog, I think these are still worth playing nowadays. And like Nitro Kart, Tag Team Racing is doing really well here with the Pi 5. Let's now shift gears and switch to a completely different genre. Def Jam Vendetta is a wrestling game that, as the title suggests, uses the Def Jam license. Def Jam Vendetta is an awesome game and one of the biggest reasons for that is the development team behind it. The Aki Corporation was responsible for all the great wrestling games like No Mercy and WrestleMania on the Nintendo 64. There is a sequel available, Def Jam Fight for New York, but that game does not run well with the Pi 5, so Vendetta will have to do, and this one does run very well. You will want to make sure that the immediately present XFB setting is turned off. And now here's a really odd one. Doshin the Giant began life as a game from the Nintendo 64 disk drive peripheral and was released exclusively in Japan. Given the limited release and format, Nintendo went ahead and released an updated version of the game for GameCube, and this time around, it didn't make it outside of Japan, but only for European regions. So those of us in North America did not receive this game. This is definitely one weird game, and it's best described as a god simulation game, and you take control of this yellow giant named Doshin who can perform godlike abilities. I definitely think it's an interesting one to check out if you've never heard of it before, and it does remain essentially a GameCube exclusive that runs very well here on the Pi 5. And speaking of GameCube exclusives, Eternal Darkness to this day remains stuck on the GameCube, developed by Silicon Knights, who was probably best known for Blood Omen Legacy of Kain before their work on Eternal Darkness. It just so happens to be one of the coolest exclusives available for GameCube with some really awesome gameplay elements that follows several characters with very different styles and locations. This game does experience some dips in frame rate, but I didn't find it to be much of an issue and I do think it runs mostly well. You will want to make sure that the store XFB copies to texture only and immediately present XFB are both enabled. Next up we have our first EA Sports big title and part of the other street style sports games made popular during this generation. FIFA Street 2 is a street football game that builds off the style first established with the NBA Street games featuring tricks with set rules to win. FIFA Street 2 is running really well here with Pi 5 and for this one make sure to enable the immediately present XFB setting. This will definitely not be the last time we see a street game in this showcase. Moving on with another Nintendo game, and GameCube exclusive to this day, Fire Emblem Path of Radiance is the ninth main installment in the Fire Emblem series, and the only Fire Emblem game released for Nintendo GameCube. Interestingly, it is only the third game in the series to be released outside of Japan. Fire Emblem is a tactical RPG that has grown quite tremendously in popularity, especially outside of Japan. Fire Emblem is running pretty well here on the Pi 5, and this one does need the immediately present XFB setting turned on. Freedom Fighters comes to us from IO Interactive, the same studio responsible for the Hitman series, and is actually quite the gem from the 6th generation releasing on GameCube, PlayStation 2, Xbox, and PC. It's a third-person shooter that takes place in an alternate history in which the Soviet Union has invaded and occupied New York City. You take control of a resistance movement leader, and it's definitely a shame that this game has not been revisited. However, this might be due to the publishing rights as Electronic Arts was responsible for this one and not their current parent company, Square Enix. Freedom Fighters is running really well here with the Raspberry Pi 5, and I definitely recommend checking this one out. The Nintendo games just keep coming, and again, we have another GameCube exclusive. Kirby Air Ride is such an awesome racing game that is definitely very Kirby in style. This game is literally played with just the A button and an analog stick, but still retains everything that makes Kirby, well, Kirby, just in racing form. There's a lot of really interesting things about this game, one of which being that this was the last Kirby game directed by Masahiro Sakurai, better known for the Super Smash Bros. games. Like the many other Nintendo GameCube games, this one remains locked to the GameCube, and the concept has never been revisited by Nintendo. This one holds up pretty well with the Raspberry Pi 5, and it's a blast to play and well worth checking out. The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker is going to be the only Zelda game in this showcase as the Twilight Princess unfortunately has an issue with the minimap and despite trying various fixes as well as some other builds of Dolphin, I could not resolve the problem on the Pi 5. But no worries, we do have The Wind Waker here and this is a pretty solid performing game here. I remember when this game was first announced and wow the response to it was so divided. However, I think over time many have embraced the awesome cell shaded style and Wind Waker is no stranger to the channel being used many times before as a good benchmark game for GameCube emulation. 
LEGO Star Wars 2 The Original Trilogy is one of many LEGO style games from Traveler's Tales that became very popular during the 6th generation, and LEGO Star Wars 2, as the name implies, is the second in the LEGO Star Wars series and based on the original trilogy of movies. I want to include at least one of these games in the showcase as they are a lot of fun to play and definitely a great multiplayer game as well. LEGO Star Wars 2 is running really well here on the Pi 5. Luigi's Mansion is for me one of the most iconic games on the GameCube, and rightfully so. This game did launch with the console and I have very fond memories of playing it for the first time and just being blown away by the graphics. It was clearly a pretty loved game as it is the 5th best selling GameCube game and because of its loyal following, we started to see sequels in the series more recently. Luigi's Mansion did get a remake for the 3DS, but I'm pretty happy to see that Luigi's Mansion is running quite well with the Pi 5. The game does have graphical issues, for example, the flashlight and vacuum are probably the most noticeable, but otherwise it does seem to be pretty solid. The MMJR fork of Dolphin does correct this issue, but unfortunately it doesn't play too well with the Pi 5 and I experienced a lot of crashing. Now we can't let Luigi have all the spotlight. Here is our first Mario entry with Mario Superstar Baseball. This is the first time that Mario and crew tackled the sport of baseball and it won't be the last time. This is a pretty fun take on baseball with the usual Mario sports treatment. For Mario Superstar Baseball, you will want to make sure that the immediately present XFB option is enabled, but otherwise this game runs really well with the Pi 5. Silicon Knights returns to this showcase with a surprisingly divided remake of the original Metal Gear Solid. The Twin Snakes introduces new cutscenes and gameplay brought in from Metal Gear Solid 2 as well as updated graphics. Personally, I enjoy this game quite a bit, but I also enjoy the original on the PlayStation 1. This one exhibited interesting performance, so it wasn't quite full speed at times, but I found it fairly playable and then at other times it ran really well. I think it's still worth including here and showcasing this game as it's definitely worth trying out. For this game, make sure to have the immediately present XFB setting turned off. Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance is our next entry and this is really an awesome entry in the Mortal Kombat franchise. It's the first time that a Mortal Kombat game dropped onto a home console without any related arcade release. This game is credited with being responsible for reviving the Mortal Kombat franchise and for me, it definitely did that. Gameplay wise, this entry introduces different fighting styles that you can switch between in a match. I'm also really happy that the performance here on the Pi 5 is really great with this game and for this one you will want to enable the immediately present XFB setting. Mystic Heroes is a hack and slash game developed by Koei, best known for their Dynasty Warriors series of games. In fact, Mystic Heroes is essentially the only Musou style game available on the GameCube as it did not receive any of the Dynasty or Samurai Warriors entries, and so for GameCube owners, this is about as good as it will get. Mystic Heroes is a pretty fun game and if you enjoy the other hack and slash style games, it's definitely well worth checking out given the limited options on GameCube. The game is pretty playable with the Pi 5, but I did notice frame rate dips, but overall, it didn't seem to impact gameplay too much. Here's another EA Sports big entry and probably one of my favorite games from this generation. NBA Street Volume 2 takes everything awesome from the first one and improves on it. But what's not to love with this? You get arcade style basketball with great music, graphics, and gameplay. The best part is that this game runs incredibly well with the Pi 5, and for this one, just make sure to enable the immediately present XFB option. Otherwise, I'd say Pi 5 owners really need to have this one loaded on their devices as it's a solid game even if you're not a basketball fan. Okay, this is probably going to be the only truly traditional sports game on the list and a selfish entry since I am a huge hockey fan. I figure why not, let's load up some NHL 06 and see how things go here. I forgot how much faster the gameplay was with the older NHL entries and honestly it's a blast to play. The graphics hold up pretty well and best of all the performance here with the Raspberry Pi 5 is excellent. For NHL 06, you will want to make sure that the immediately present XFB option is turned on. Our next entry is another personal favorite game and series. I absolutely love the Pikmin franchise and Pikmin 2 improves on the original by adding new gameplay mechanics and the ability to control two different characters at once. The original Pikmin and Pikmin 2 would actually get a re-release for the Wii with new controls added as well as a HD remaster for the Nintendo Switch. The Pikmin games tend to run quite well on a lot of hardware, so I wasn't all too surprised that this one is doing well here with the Pi 5. The personal favorites just keep coming here, and The Prince of Persia Sands of Time is yet another great game that I am very fond of. I remember playing the demo for this one and just being completely blown away by the gameplay mechanics. The game had a slow start sales-wise, despite the very positive reception. Thankfully, Ubisoft kept with it, and eventually the game would become a commercial success, leading to multiple sequels on the GameCube. The Sands of Time is another game that performs very well here with the Pi 5, and for this, you will want to make sure that the immediately present XFB option is turned off. 
Capcom had massive support for the GameCube, and Resident Evil Zero was an exclusive release for the GameCube at the time and a brand new original entry in the Resident Evil franchise. Zero takes place before the events of the original Resident Evil, and for better or worse features very similar gameplay style from the other Resident Evil games released during the PlayStation 1 era. Apparently Resident Evil Zero began development originally for the Nintendo 64 and its main gameplay feature, the partner zapping, was designed with the N64's short load times in mind. Obviously development shifted to GameCube retaining much of the N64 prototype's features. Zero has been re-released multiple times, starting with the Wii, going all the way to the more current consoles like the PS4 and Xbox One. Performance is very good here on the Pi 5. One last thing, I did test Resident Evil 4, but unfortunately the game does have graphical issues and so it will not be featured here. Sega Soccer Slam is another soccer game with an arcade style making the list, but this is such a unique entry since we really haven't seen this game return. Black Box was the studio responsible for this game and they were probably best known for their work on the Need for Speed series at one point. Sega Soccer Slam is actually a pretty fun take on soccer and reminds me a bit of another football game that we will be talking about in just a little bit. Sega Soccer Slam is another game that is doing really well here with the Pi 5 and for this one, make sure to keep the immediately present XFB option off. Serious Sam The Next Encounter is the only Serious Sam game that was released for the GameCube and is considered a spin-off of the mainline games. The Next Encounter does contain many of the elements that the series is known for, including the fast, frantic first-person shooter gameplay. Interestingly, the developers claim much of their influence for this entry came from games such as GoldenEye 007, Perfect Dark, Smash TV, and even Contra. This is a fun, pick-up-and-play style game that doesn't take itself too seriously. It also happens to perform pretty well on the Pi 5, despite the nature of gameplay and amount of enemies on screen. Smuggler's Run is another franchise that has seemingly disappeared, only appearing on 6th gen consoles. Smuggler's Run War Zones is essentially Smuggler's Run 2 from the PlayStation 2. This is a really fun game that has you transporting all sorts of illegal cargo with time constraints that make it quite challenging. The franchise never appeared on Xbox, and sadly this is the last time we would see any entry in the Smuggler's Run franchise. Smuggler's Run War Zones works great on the Pi 5, and it's another perfect pickup and play game for the Pi. My friend Shem from Retro Breeze will be really happy about this inclusion for the showcase. Sonic Heroes is going to be the only Sonic game making this video, but it's an interesting game well worth talking about. Sonic Heroes is a return to the traditional linear style gameplay of Sonic compared to entries like Sonic Adventure 1 and 2. Not only that, but it's also the first multi-platform Sonic release which was available on PS2, Xbox, GameCube, and PC. The game allows you to switch up between Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles on the fly and you will need them all to be able to properly tackle environments and obstacles. Despite how fast Sonic may be, he's luckily not too much for the Pi 5 to handle and this is yet another game doing fairly well here. Soul Calibur 2 is the sequel to the incredibly popular Soul Calibur and is the third entry in the Soul series of games. The GameCube version did particularly well because of its inclusion of Link as a playable character which was also a first for the series. The PS2 version featured Heihachi from Tekken, with the Xbox version featuring Spawn. Soul Calibur 2 features the same weapon-based combat the series is known for, with some small improvements to gameplay, but overall is a really solid entry, and especially the GameCube version because of Link. Soul Calibur 2 is doing pretty well here on the Pi 5, and for this you will want to turn on the immediately present XFB preset. SSX Tricky is yet another EA Sports big title, and honestly it's one of the best snowboarding games ever released. SSX Tricky just improves on everything that made the original great, which was a PS2 exclusive, and Tricky would be the first time that the SSX series went multi-platform. The game does have frame dips, but I felt like it didn't impact gameplay too much, and I still really wanted to include this game for the showcase because of how much I enjoy it. For this game, you will need to turn on the immediately present XFB setting, but otherwise, don't expect that performance is perfect with this one, but mostly playable. Star Fox Assault is set after the events of Star Fox Adventures, which by the way I did test but performance was not good at all with that one. Luckily I was able to get some Star Fox action going with Assault, which is a more traditional entry in the Star Fox series and features the R-Wing, Landmaster, and even on-foot segments. Personally I love the R-Wing segments and wish the game did without the on-foot segments which felt like a mess. Star Fox Assault does run quite well in the Pi 5, so when it comes to Star Fox games, this will be the one you want to play on the Pi 5 as Adventures doesn't fare as well. Super Mario Sunshine is no doubt one of the iconic games from the GameCube and one that remained an exclusive only until recently when they finally got a port to Nintendo Switch. 
I feel like Super Mario Sunshine doesn't get as much love as it deserves, and for me personally, it's a Mario game I enjoy quite a bit. And every time I start this one up again, I can't help but play it for a while. I can definitely tell this one is pushing the limits of what we can do here with the Pi 5, as Mario Sunshine's performance isn't perfect, but I'm still pretty impressed with what I've seen here. For this game, you will need to enable quite a few settings in the hack section, which I will have detailed on screen. One other thing, you do not want to use the widescreen hack option as it has bad graphical issues. Instead, you will want to enable cheat support by going into settings, then general, and turning on the enable cheats option. The next thing you'll want to do is long press on Super Mario Sunshine and select the edit cheats option. Scroll down and you will see that Dolphin already has the widescreen gecko code listed and just toggle it on. Finally, we have reached the other popular football game on the GameCube. Super Mario Strikers is the first time we have seen Mario take on the sport of football. Apparently, this was the last Mario game to be released on GameCube in both Japan and North America. The studio behind Strikers Next Level Games actually worked on NHL Hits Pro right before it came out, and so it served as the influence for the over-the-top and fast-paced nature of Strikers, which makes it a blast to play. Strikers has now become a consistent series, seeing a more recent release on the Nintendo Switch. On the Pi 5, Strikers is running quite well and another game well worth checking out. We have finally made it to Super Smash Bros. Melee, and probably the most well-known title from GameCube given that it's also the best-selling game on the console. Super Smash Bros. Melee took the Nintendo 64 version and improved on it in every single way possible. For many, Melee is still considered the premier Smash Bros. experience. I remember loading this game up for the first time and just being blown away by the awesome intro with the orchestral soundtrack that just took it to the next level. Now, Smash Brothers does mostly well in the Pi 5, but it's probably not at unexpected that it does vary based on the stage being played. I'd say overall though that this is pretty playable and I think for many will be a big deal to see. Tales of Symphonia was an exclusive action RPG in the Tales of series for the Nintendo GameCube and definitely a pretty big deal at the time as the GameCube was starred for RPG games. It is the fifth game in the mainline Tales of series, and wow did I pour a lot of time into this game when it first dropped probably nearing about 60 hours. I wish I still had as much time to devote to RPGs like back in the day. This was one meaty game that featured great graphics, voice acting, and the awesome action-based combat system the Tales series is known for. Symphonia's exclusivity was sort of short-lived as it did receive a PS2 port about a year later, but only in Japan. Eventually, the game would be re-released multiple times as recent as a Nintendo Switch version. Tales of Symphonia does run very well with the Pi 5, and if you don't mind some potential dips, you can even push this one to two times the native resolution. Time Splitters 2 is a great first-person shooter game from Free Radical, a studio that was comprised of former members of the Rare team that worked on GoldenEye 007. The first Time Splitters was a PS2 exclusive, and with the sequel, Time Splitters went multi platform. The influence from games like GoldenEye and Perfect Dark is very apparent with Time Splitters, which is definitely not a bad thing, and the entire series is well worth checking out. For the Pi 5, Time Splitters 2 runs really well, and unfortunately, I did test Time Splitters Future Perfect, but that one did not fare as well. Next up, we have Tomb Raider Legend, and this was the first time that the Tomb Raider series was handled by Crystal Dynamics, who took the reins of the Tomb Raider franchise away from core design after the failure of Tomb Raider The Angel of Darkness. For their first effort, Legend is a pretty solid Tomb Raider game, and probably the best that was seen in many years, and it returned to form for many. Crystal Dynamics to this day is still the developer behind Tomb Raider, and highlights their effective handling of the series. Legend is running very well here on the Raspberry Pi 5, and this is the only Tomb Raider game available for the Nintendo GameCube. It's almost impossible not to talk about a Tony Hawk game, especially when it was at its height of popularity during this time. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3 is the first entry that was available on the Nintendo GameCube, and definitely not the last. For this video, I thought it would be best to go with the first entry for the GameCube, and Pro Skater 3 does hold up mostly well on the Pi 5 with some occasional dips here and there. The menu screens definitely have lower frame rate, but in-game it does seem to do pretty well overall. Now here's a pretty interesting game. Vex is a 3D platformer from now defunct Acclaim Studios, and it's actually a pretty decent game. I don't think many remember or even talk about this game, but it's well worth checking out, especially if you enjoy 3D platformers like Mario 64. It's definitely not the most polished game, as was typical from acclaimed developed games, but if you haven't tried this, I definitely recommend checking it out. Vex does run mostly well with the Pi 5, and is another that does suffer from some occasional dips in frame rate. For this one, make sure to enable the immediately present XFB setting. 
I mentioned earlier that Capcom was a big supporter of the GameCube, and Beautiful Joe was part of that massive support known as the Capcom 5. Beautiful Joe was a brand new property for Capcom and originally an exclusive game for GameCube, but eventually it would get ported to the PlayStation 2. This is an awesome side-scrolling beat-em-up with an amazing visual style and gameplay elements and is a must-play for GameCube. The best part is that this game does very well with the Raspberry Pi 5 and you will want to ensure that the immediately present XFB setting is turned off. WarioWare Inc. Mega Party Games is the second installment in the WarioWare series and is as frantic and silly as many of the other entries. This one does take a lot of the minigames from the original on the Game Boy Advance, but it's still a great time nonetheless, and definitely a fun one for multiplayer. I don't think it's much of a surprise here, but WarioWare does run very well with the Raspberry Pi 5. And one more Wario game, here is Wario World, which is definitely the more interesting Wario game on the GameCube. This was developed by Treasure, best known for their vast amount of awesome shmups like Ikaruga and Radiant Silvergun. It reminds me a bit of another one of Treasure's games, Guardian Heroes, except that Mario can freely move around, but the levels are very much linear based with some platforming and plenty of combat. The game did not sell well at all, but despite this, I think it's a really fun and in many ways a forgotten gem that I would have loved to see return in some capacity. The best part though is the game does run very well on the Raspberry Pi 5, and hopefully some will experience the game for the first time. And we have finally made it to the very last game being featured here, and technically returning from my Raspberry Pi 5 in-depth review video. Wave Race Blue Storm is just one I have to always talk about when discussing GameCube, and I really love the Wave Race franchise, and Blue Storm is no exception. This game has awesome graphics and just fun, classic Wave Race gameplay. It's sadly the last time we have seen the Wave Race franchise, but thankfully it does run very well on the Pi 5, and this one will be a permanent addition to my Pi 5 library. We've come to the end of this showcase, and I hope that this was helpful to those that own a Pi 5 or might be considering one in the future. It's always fun to test the limit of what's possible on new hardware, and I have really enjoyed my time exploring GameCube emulation on the Pi 5. I don't think I'm quite done yet with the Pi 5, and there will be plenty more to come, but until then, as always, I am the Retro Tech Dad, and thank you so much for watching.